people. Uh, we're looking for companies that are, you know, in that early validation stage, maybe like post ID, you've got an idea, uh, ideally, and you're doing, you've done some market sort of validation of it, and you want to come and say what it's all about. It's a good opportunity for you to um, just practice your company elevator pitch in front of a live audience, whether you're going to use it for fundraising or uh, really anybody that you're trying to recruit to your company, whether it's a customer or an employee, um, uh, you, can't, you can't practice your, your pitch enough. Um, and you got a great audience here who's going to give you feedback, ask you questions. Um, that's what it's all about. Uh, let's see what else. Other thank yous to A2 Geeks. Uh, A2 Geeks helps make events like this happen. Uh, Coffee House Coders, uh, Ann Arbor Ignite. Um, I think there's another one that they have going on this month. That's not coming to me. But they're just a great nonprofit in town that helps make this meetup possible. Um, I mentioned Roger from R2 Vive, who's doing our live streaming and recording. Has been doing it for quite some time and a number of other events in town. And then um, this space, so University of Michigan's Entrepreneurship Clinic at uh, University of Michigan Law um, has given us a space for over a year now, and we have it for the first half of next year, just found out. So we'll continue to be here third Tuesday every month, 6.30. Uh, and as soon as I get people confirmed, I try to put it up on the meetup page um, so you can know who's presenting. So, uh, mute your phone if you haven't yet. Uh, if you're going to tweet, use A2 New Tech hashtag. And uh, first up, I'd like to welcome Julia Winter from Alchemy. Thank you. There's the tweets if you want to tweet. Are you ready? Yes. You're ready. I'm Julia Winter, the CEO of Alchemy. We create mobile games for science. So higher education is in transition. Learning outcomes and student retention are now being measured and reported. Yet gateway courses, especially in science, are taught in large lecture halls where the descriptors for the learning that takes place haven't changed in decades. Yet students are able to learn at any time and any place. And those adjectives are completely different. This is the opportunity of Alchemy. We're creating the mobile game-based learning tools for students, capturing the data from those tools, translating it back to the universities, and increasing learning outcomes for everyone. And we're starting first with what could be the toughest course in college, organic chemistry. It's this critical piece needed to move into careers in science and medicine, yet the fail rate for organic chemistry is between 40 and 50 percent. Career plans derail, confidence decline, and the pieces for students fall apart. For over 20 years, I've taught college level organic chemistry in class sizes of just 12 to 16 students. I know why students struggle, and I've learned to help them to succeed. My team and I are taking what I know and translating it into our games. Our first game, called Chairs, has been released for both iOS and Android. It takes a small concept taught at the beginning of the course and turns it into a puzzle game. With no marketing, we have over 8,500 users and professors and students worldwide called the game addictive and fun. We've done a classroom trial and it shows a big increase in learning of this small concept. If you want the game, you text CHEM, C-H-E-M, to 555-888. But it's still a very small part of the curriculum. The big idea in organic chemistry is called mechanisms and our signature game is the mechanism game and it spans the entire curriculum into graduate levels. We'll be layering in kinesthetic audio and visual cues into gameplay, making the theoretical touchable. That's our tagline. Our ideas are turning heads in the ed tech world. I just got back from Silicon Valley where I won a Digital Innovation and Learning Award and we have an SBIR grant from the NSF to build out this big game and spin out four other puzzle games from the UX of the mechanism game. So, who are the students who take organic chemistry? Well, there are 800,000 students in the US, millions of more worldwide, and the general chemistry market is two and a half times as big as organic, and we've already started plans for games for that. 
Our revenue streams are threefold. We'll market direct to those students, but our big play early on is to go through universities and professors to, through site licenses. We are also license our patented game technology to publishers, and we've already started those conversations with different publishers. But the real alchemy of alchemy is the data. We'll be capturing that data, translating it back, giving it to the university so they can target struggling students before they fail. Our team is a great blend of youth and experience, old, and in business, game development, ed tech, and marketing. We have nine professors at eight universities on our advisory board and 60 more instructors and professors on our beta testing list. We'll start with organic chemistry and expand vertically into chemistry before tackling any other subjects. Our method works. We make the theoretical touchable. A tactile interface enhances intuition, but intuition comes from making mistakes. And the pieces come together for students because games make mistakes fun. So the alchemy games will help students succeed. Thank you very much. Tweet away. Hey, whatever. I'd love to hear your questions. Check, check. Um, I don't know if these microphones work. I think they do if you're really loud. But okay. um, yeah, so we'll take some questions um, and start right yeah. in the middle. Hi, um, my cousin was taking organic chemistry this summer, and she was using a sort of interactive learning tool of some sort. Do you have any competitors that like you know? Like Sapley Learning, probably? Yeah, I, I would think so. Do we have lots of, we have competitors in the support market for sure because. There's, there's a market there, but there's no one making games. And so that's where my developers are game designers, and we're also, I'll, I'll pull them up, we're working with Shell Games of Pittsburgh to build the best, beautiful games around. So we got Jesse Shell on board, and so we're going to be starting January 1 in Ann Arbor, and then the development team will be working out of the Shell Games studio. Because there's not a lot of game design in higher ed. Yeah, hey. You mentioned uh, something about um, a, uh, a patent, maybe around the, the particular mechanism you're using to uh, teach chemistry through games. Could you talk a little bit about the defensibility? Well, that's where my, our patent attorney, he's got a PhD in organic chemistry from Harvard and, and whatever. He, when he saw what we did, it's not on code, it's on the interaction. And so chairs has a little, I mean, it's, I mean, nobody's going to, go and make a chair game, but he, we showed how to patent the chair interaction. And then the other one is on the tactile learning for chemistry, bringing a tactile approach to teaching and bringing in user experience and kinesthetic cues to teach organic chemistry. It hasn't been issued yet, but we have, we've, it's been published, but we'll see what, the, what it comes back with the claims and stuff like that. So, I mean, he made the claims, we'll see what happens once the examiners come back with that. Yes? Uh, how long ago did you file? Uh, well, a year ago for chairs, six months ago, we just got, we just published on the mechanism game patent. So any day now, I mean, he's a pretty pretty good patent attorney. I don't know what's going on. I'll just let him do his thing. Yeah, I always yeah. heard that if, if you get the patent accepted immediately, you should fire your patent attorney. <laughs> Because he didn't cover enough claims. Oh, to argue okay, enough no, this guy, he, he's awesome. He's at Brooks Cushman. He's, he's, <laughs> chemistry is his specialty. Yes? Um, with game comes the scores. Any uh, extension to grading? You know, that's part of the platform. Like our phase two of the SBIR will be building the data platform. And it wouldn't be the grading, it would be formative assessment to give back to the professors. So the, the students can play their games, and actually students freak out about this, because they're like, no, I want to play the game for fun. So you probably have to have a switch. This is the formative assessment side, and this is the gameplay side. And that will get back to, that's the plan with the data piece. And we're watching students learn at a really small grain size. So this, this is where the EdTech people are really excited because we're going to be collecting data as students make sense of a concept, which is a really cool thing, but it's a lot of data. So that's where we have to be really mindful as we build that. 
Yes. Could you just expand upon who pays for this or what the financial model so is? So what we're going to do is we will build out like a pack of puzzles yeah. and, the, and the games actually can be tuned to curriculum and so when we say site license to the university they'll either be required to buy as a curricular product or recommended and ultimately it's always going to be the student that pays i mean my husband's a chemistry professor they're not going to pay for this so it's the students that pay for it you just have to make it cost effective for them and it has to work i mean you can't it, it can't be crap so like this is my um just can't this is the learning outcomes for my chairs game you with edtech you have to actually prove efficacy before you can sell anything. So you have to be out in front and test it in classrooms. So this was the chair game. So students, uh, I taught the concept and then gave them a quiz and those who hadn't played the game at home scored zero through four, most of them, it was pretty divided throughout the pie. Whereas if they played the game, they scored far higher and then they played throughout the class period and took the quiz again. So that's one of the things with EdTech, you have to be, you have to make, have it be a learning experience before you can sell it. Yeah? Um, is this uh, learning concept applicable to other subjects? Not well, it has, you know, I've struggled with general chem. I've been teaching AP Chem for as many years as organic. You have to come up with the conceptual pieces, not the mathematical pieces. So it has to be subjects that can fit into that mold. Like physics would work fine. We could do physics. People have said we could do stats and econ, but I'm not a stats and econ person, so I don't know that. But yes, I think so. Thank you. All right, we're gonna roll right along to uh, Bob Chung here from Content Oro. Tell us, gonna tell us how to make content market it so much easier. Uh, I knew I should have brought the clicker, but I didn't, so I'm just going to stand back here. No, it's okay. It would take me forever to set it up. <laughs> All right. Tell me more. Okay, so Good. my name is Bob Chan. I'm the CEO and founder of Content Doro. The content marketing is the fastest growing form of advertising and marketing in the world. Brands are spending $144 billion a year to talk to all of you in your favorite ways through Facebook and Twitter and Vine and through email and online by having what we call as bedrock content. Um, the information that you're looking for and searching for to live your lives, you now look to the internet to provide. Um, the advantage, to, the advantage to businesses uh, for having this content on their websites is they get to sell you something. The problem that they have is they can't keep up with the pace of the, the addition of new channels to talk to all of you. So their, their only choice today to write content for their websites or social media or blogs is to either turn their marketing department into a writing department or to hire freelance writers. Those are their two choices. Freelance writers are expensive. It takes a lot of time to work with them. Um, <laughs> she probably is a freelance writer, really. Um, but uh, they take a lot of time to work with, and, uh, and they're not experts, as we all know, because we're bouncing around from one web page to another web page, trying to find the information that we need. Um, an example is I work for Pet Supplies Plus where uh, I was trying to differentiate my company from Petco and PetSmart. They're number one, number two, I was number three. I saw that Petco, neither Petco or PetSmart had a guide to dog breeds on their site, and through research I knew that those were the primary things, uh, dog breeds specifically, were what people were searching for most frequently in the pet category. I did an RFP, a request for proposal, and what I got back caused me to quit my job. Um, what I got back was a cost of $200,000 in six months um, to produce a guide to dog breeds. And I knew that there had to be a better way. Um, when I talk about my team, I'll tell you that I came from Borders. And uh, I worked with uh, book publishers to repurpose 
um, book inventory and create new books from old books. That was my job there. So I knew that publishers had do, uh, guides to dog breeds that they weren't actively selling. And if I could figure out how to extract the contents of those books and to deliver them to websites, I'd have an exceptional solution for Pet Supplies Plus and any other company doing business online because there are 130 million of these sitting in publishers' archives covering every conceivable topic um, and uh, from every conceivable angle, written by experts, edited by experts, and up to date. Publishing hasn't stopped, even though a lot of us think that it has. So how do we get it done? We work with, we work directly with book publishers. We share revenue with them. We get exclusive license to use the contents of their books in an online environment. We pass that on to our customer and we, we share revenue back to publishers in exchange. Um, <coughs> In order to do this, uh, we call ourselves a technology company and we've developed proprietary technology to systematically extract the contents of books in small usable pieces and parts that we call Oro, that we mine from the millions of books that are at our disposal and that we deliver to websites. So that we can do, I'm going to show you an actual example here of what we do. So this is Pet Supplies Plus's site. Right now they have one page that they've dedicated to dogs. Not good enough. Um, but in this example, we're showing how um, you could insert using our code another piece of content into this. You see that it doesn't quite look the same as, uh, as the rest of the content. Um, with our streaming technology, we can change the, the look and feel of the content to match exactly our customer's site. So now you can't tell where theirs begins and ours ends. Now, Pet Supplies Plus looks like this. I don't know how I did that. These are the problems with live demos, right? And so we're covering every, specific, every breed of dog that exists for Pet Supplies Plus. They're having that stream to their website. It happens in about uh, an hour versus uh, six months or a year. It costs Pet Supplies Plus around $10,000 instead of $200,000. And I'm gonna beep here in a short second. This is a site that we built out with, uh, oh, there we go. So, <laughs> questions. search your content to say, hey, this looks like content, or do they work with you and you you dig up through your archive and through your... These, these five minute presentations, they just don't give me a lot of time, but what we're building is the world's first content marketplace, where businesses can come and search for, find, check out with content that they want and use it that day. It's, the, it's taking getting images and applying it to written content. Um, do you do something in the air, it's something in the areas of transportation and taxation. There, there is, uh, I mean, with 130 million books at our disposal, there's no limit to, uh, to the subject matter that's covered. There's, nobody's been able to give me a challenge or to find a, a subject that isn't covered in, in a book in depth, in detail. So yes. Do you run into situations where people are using the same content? Like, if I was like mining, like I'm doing dogs, he's doing dogs, he pulls up something, would could we be duplicating the same information? No, um, we only give one piece of content to one customer at a time to avoid avoid uh, having duplicate content on the web, which is which is uh, uh, Google punishes you for. Uh, so they're they're literally you know, Google drives sixty four percent of all website traffic. The advantage we're bringing to businesses is deep authoritative content that fits Google's mission very specifically. Um, and we do that by assigning exclusive license to our content for one customer at a time. Do you, um, how long are the licenses usually then? So anywhere, um, our agreements with publishers are, they're giving us exclusive rights to the content for a three year period. 
um, that automatically renews. So, so our customers can have access to it for up to 21 years. Um, How does the digitization uh, happen? So, Are these so already e-books or? We take a, we, we can work anywhere from a physical book or a PDF or, or an EPUB file. And uh, Yeltsin Yanakoglu, who is here with me today, designed software to extract the contents of those digital files uh, by looking at first a paragraph, and then we build back up into an intelligent piece of, of content, like a recipe or, or a dog read or instructions to change your oil or um, the, the uh, attributes of red blood cells. Um, you know, so we're taking uh, paragraphs and building it back up into something that's uh, substantial and meaningful. Would you provide um, the option for links back to the book to promote the book sort of as part of the compensation? We do. We offer that um, to, to our, our customers and to the publishers. So if it fits everybody's uh, desires, then we can do that. Um, and we can stream that to our customers. So. We're not handing over a file. This is what makes the, the business usable for publishers. We're not handing over a file that has them losing control of their content entirely. We're, we're streaming content to them, to their website. It simplifies the interface so that they're not, uh, our customer, in this case, in Pet Supplies Plus's case, um, it's about 120,000 lines of code that they would be managing to have this entire book um, of content on their website. With us, they're, they're implementing 19 lines of code in total to have um, every dog breed that exists in, in the world covered. How, um, what's the, the yeah. like, go to market for look like for somebody like going on to buy is this completely self-service or you're gonna have to be involved? I think you mentioned like maybe $10,000 being the average like annual price that someone would pay to get this. So, so I didn't mention an average price. Today, we don't have a marketplace where, you know, that's we're raising money to build a marketplace. What we have is a, a boutique consultative sale. Um, so our pitch to PetSmart, uh, the, the deal that we're working on them with is, is actually a million dollars annual recurring revenue um, for about a million pages of content. Um, they would have them, instead of one page per dog breed, um, they would have about 400 pages. They would be the authority on dogs on the internet, period, around the world. Nobody would compete with them. And that's by combining, uh, not just it's not just one book, it's many books combined um, and streaming to their site in a way that, that they can use. Cool. Oh, thank you. thank you. So next up we got uh, Jay from uh, IOIO, Creative Technologies. Uh, he's going to tell us about a product he's working on called Craftworks. And then you put me on right after like a couple pro speakers. Hi. <laughs> a good public speaker. I'll give it a shot. <laughs> I think I made it a little bit easier. I don't know if it, how many people know Scott Gochi, but we worked on the video. Uh, so I'm going to play that first. Let's switch. Okay, cool. Yeah, your screen's up. And the audio should be good. Are you tired of navigating through dozens and dozens of menus just to get that one feature you need? Are you sick of learning long, complicated key binaries that you'll never remember? <laughs> Wish the way you interacted with your personal computer was a bit more personal? <laughs> Introducing Crackers, a new way to interact with hardware and software. <laughs> Everyone remembers those space age user interfaces you saw in science fiction, right? Well, we brought that technology into the present age, which allowed you to create custom UIs that let you do all sorts of things. Normally, creating music can involve apps dollars of equipment and clutter your workstation. Now, all these user interfaces can live in one device, saving you tons of money and your sanity. Craftworks comes jam-packed with pre-existing user interfaces, from crazy pianos to remote controls for your television. But if you don't 
find one you like, with our custom editor, you can create your own, even using a drag and drop interface. Craftworks has all types of uses. Use it for gaming. Use it for 3D modeling. You can even use it to set the mood on that special night. The possibilities are endless. Order yours today, and never interact with menus again. This is the creation of IOIO, an Ann Arbor-based company. While the infomercial may be a joke, this product is real and is awesome. Try us today. So first of all, like hands off to like Scott. Woo! See the other the other speakers. Like I have to unfortunately go after go off of my tablet here and kind of read off of this. And then, <laughs> well, you started off with that, so oh, okay. <laughs> Okay, so uh, uh, Kiwi Crapwork started out as a maker project about three years ago. Uh, we needed to design a keyboard, or music keyboard, for an electronics project for a summer camp for kids, where we could teach them, uh, where we teach them electronics under the guise of music. It's a program that a small group of educators and I were piloting at a community center in Detroit. We wanted to design a keyboard that anyone, regardless of music background or maybe someone with special needs, could walk up to and in the least amount of time become proficient enough to create generally good quality music using it. Uh, it worked really, really well with these kids and they were able to put together some amazing songs that most importantly shocked even themselves. I still play the shit out of this keyboard uh, every day because it's, even for experienced musicians, you can create and play music that isn't quite possible on traditional instruments. And then drawing from my studio experiences and time as a recording artist with Metal Blade Records, Warner Brothers Records, and especially my time with Warner Chapel where we scored uh, movie soundtracks, TV shows, and commercials, uh, we had a clinical style methodology to the creative process, a uh, workflow of sorts, and the way we collaborated with each other. And adding to that, over time I saw a lot of problems with the way digital artists like musicians, videographers, 3D modelers, and illustrators interfaced with uh, their software and hardware. Uh, with art, when the idea comes, you can't have your left side brain thinking overpowering the creative side by thinking too hard about how you're going to get things done. And so what Craftworks does is it creates an artist workstation by putting all of the menu options, functions, and features of the artist's software or their hardware of choice out there in front of them and just a button press away. Uh, easy stuff like copy, cut, and pasting or adding a new layer in Photoshop all the way to more a comprehensive touchpad like controller for 3D modeling gives the artist far more, far more efficient control over their workflow as compared to traditional mouse and keyboard methods, and even superior to later but far more gimmicky touchscreen versions of the software. Um, over, over the years, we've added a ton of protocols, and the scope of Craftworks has widened quite a bit. Uh, now makers can quickly create front ends for their Arduino or Raspberry Pi projects, and in reverse, musicians can easily incorporate Arduino or Raspberry Pis into their projects. Even people outside of the arts, like a data center, could control multiple servers from one screen. Recording studios could control racks and racks of effects units from a tablet. Uh, and our support of audio programming, programming languages like Chuck or Super Collider, uh, musicians can now even create their own synthesizers, distortions, reverbs, and emulate uh, devices that are already out there or prototype their own devices. So it's kind of blown up from what, it can, from what can be done, what we originally had. Uh, the hope is to kind of create a community where people can design and share in these control services and possibly a place for people that design them to potentially sell them. Uh, we've made uh, developing, oops, I say, uh, we've made developing point and click easy for artists or as complicated as they want to get with Lua and HTML5. Whoops. Again, sorry, I'm not like much of a public speaker. <laughs> If I want to use this thing as a, as a product, what it, do I purchase, um, I have a existing Windows touchscreen device, I guess, and I purchase your software that I then run on the device? Like, I think we're time, but we've been talking with like, uh, a few people, and, and we've got 
I do would be to, to actually start producing our own hardware too. So, but but yeah, you could you could just pick up. They're really they're like surprisingly inexpensive too. Like a Windows tablets can come for eighty dollars, or you can get like a large, a pretty large touch screen for like two fifty, you know, three hundred. So it's, it's, it comes up to like you know like to our price of a keyboard. You know, like if, like in video production, for example, you know, we have like, these like huge control services that cost like thousands and thousands of dollars for like a school or something. You know, they could replace you know these huge control panels with just like a you know, touch screen device for five hundred bucks or something. What does the software cost? Uh, right now we're we're looking at probably between six and eight hundred bucks. Price of a video game. How are people finding out about it right now? Well, like, like for a long time, we were kind of just operating kind of like shadow mode while, while we developed it. I mean, just really in the past month that we even like really started to like talk about it. When you're doing a, you're doing an Indiegogo? Yeah, we, we, we tried that and then I kind of pulled back from that. Like, I don't think it's like a really good product for like Indiegogo. So, ah, so like, interesting. Like, you know, people want like the gimmicky kind of things that they can hang their keychains on. And that would be just like some stuff like that. Huh. So, so you can go up somewhere. I think I read your Indiegogo that you were kind of about 80% done with the project. Um, what is the part that you really need? What, where, where are you kind of stuck that's not making the scope? And it seems like a really useful thing to a lot of artists. Yeah, um, I, was, I was like, one of the biggest things I want to add into it is, uh, is I, want to, I want to change the, the graphics presentation layer that we're using. I want to kind of pull back and I want to switch something to the 3Ds because like, you know, there's like thousands and thousands of already created 3D objects out there. It, is it something that if you just pick one section of what you're doing and said let's just go with it, that you could take off right away, or does it really need another piece to be done before you can really roll it out? Like with, with, like, with, with the Unity piece, I wouldn't want to like put it out there where people were designing, you know, screens and stuff, and become dependent on on their screens. You know, I'm just going to scrap that whole thing. Do you have videos of anybody else using it, like online, to like see like people interact with it? Not really. No. Yeah. Just, yeah. Just yeah. us. I guess that's another question along those lines. Is there some place that's using it actively as like a beta testing for you? Uh, we've, we've been like I was saying, like we've been kind of jamming with it a lot more. Ago. So we've been we've been working on it for about three years. And I invite like anybody who wants to come by. Like I work out of the office uh, right next door to the tech, right next door to the tech brewery, which is a cool working space. Uh, if anyone wants to come check it out anytime, maybe. Later tonight, I'm sure. I'll be there, so. Uh, any other questions that? I've, I've always struggled with um, a way to make uh, 3D models for like 3D printers or CNC machines, but this tool won't necessarily make me much better at 3D modeling, but it makes it makes the 3D modeling existing tools more accessible, I guess. Exactly, I mean, and that's exactly it, because it, it, it puts all of the tools like right in front of your face, so, so it, just, it really makes it a lot easier to, to operate the software, and then, you know, once you become familiarized with like where things are at, <coughs> the efficiency level of what you have to learn. Like, Also, how accessible is it to, if you find some other device that you want to control? How do you, how do you progress? How do you get into that? Well, well, you know, and, and this kind of, we, we, I kind of built it in the idea of, of the modularity, so like we can we can add things to it as, as time as time goes on. And uh, is that kind of what you're talking about? Like, yeah, like I mean, if the new device comes out with like a new protocol, we want to be able to like, add that protocol to it. The whole thing is designed from the core to, to allow more protocols. In. Okay. My, I, I'm going to steal the final question. Who all built this? Was this you so, or uh, you and part, like part really people? Me. I've, I've had uh, some interns come in and help me, but I've been pretty much like in the cave for the past three years, like, <laughs> around the clock. So. Cool. Well, everyone, check out a demo of this later on. Thanks, right. Thanks sir. Interesting piece of software to the next. Uh, now I'd like to welcome uh, Tay Fan down. Um, for those who don't know, Tay's uh, day job is running Ginger Deli downtown on, on Liberty. Uh, and this is a uh, sandwich anytime. <laughs> he's gonna show us uh, I, I, another project he's been working on when he's not making <coughs> delicious banh mi. Uh, and I'm gonna get this preset set up here in just a minute.
I'll just give you a countdown with my hands. Okay. Let's do a timer on my watch. And you're up. Hello, thank you for having us here tonight. My name is Tifan, and I'm very excited to present to you Brightview. Brightview is a visualization tool for venues and vendors to collaborate with brides to plan their dream wedding. Uh, weddings are magical, aren't they? They're a time where you and the closest people to you come together <laughs> to celebrate this special moment, right? It's a day they will never forget. Well, um, so what problem are we solving here exactly? Currently, a uh, banquet coordinator walks a bride into a room. Most of the, uh, most of the time, it's empty, right? And uh, uh, they say, imagine having your uh, weddings here. Um, let's put a table over here. Let's put a dance floor over there. Let's play with these uh, color scheme. Well, as she expressing all of these ideas and expect the brides to be able to visualize it. Well, the problem is the bride is not able to see it or imagine it. So the only way to communicate visually is to look at a bunch of uh, magazines <coughs> or go on uh, Pinterest and look at more pictures of other people's event. So this would take a lot of time. Um, the bride is more confused and overwhelmed and uh, cannot make a decision because she can't visualize her event in the room. And in turn, the coordinator not able, able to close the cells. We know this problem because we have lived uh, the past 15 years as vendors and also business owner in the uh, event industry. There's a need for a visualization tool that will help uh, solve these uh, communications and uh, planning issues. With Brightview, you can do exactly that. And let me show you. Uh, how that works. Okay, so here, let's pick a room um, uh, let's, that you want to have your event in, and this is St. John in Plymouth, Michigan. It's a beautiful banquet room, and let's set up the uh, table first, okay? You can pick and choose uh, different type of tablecloth, okay? You'll be able to pick different texture, fabric, colors. Again, okay, zoom up, you can see the details of the table. Let's uh, choose a uh, chair. Okay, and let's pick a um, seat cushion red. All right, since it's near Christmas time, I, I think it's appropriate. Okay, let's pick a uh, plate setting. Okay, and uh, you can choose, uh, let's say, a hunter green uh, uh, napkins. All right, let's pick a floor arrangement. Okay, and now let's <coughs> zoom back, right? And it all appears beautiful. Okay, and you be able to uh, let's see change uh, table configuration. All right, different layout. You can take a uh, snapshot and be able to send it to a wedding planner or a friend. All right, and let's go back. Okay, and uh, you be able to change the layout of the table. You can. Uh, Put the mother-in-law table over here. If she's, uh, <laughs> in control, right? Rotate the table. Uh, take out a dance floor and see it in 3D. Is that awesome or what? Okay. Right. Well, how, how do you make this a reality, right? So you you want to pick a, a a list of vendor, okay? In your local area, you can pick a florist, a cake. Uh, you'll be able to uh, let, let's say pick a photographer, for example. Okay, and you'll be able to see his or her uh, products and services. Okay, and let's uh, go back to the design room, all right? And now you can play a movie. This is what your family and friends will see when they walk in the room for the first time.
I don't know if you can hear it, but I hope you can feel the emotion, right? <laughs> <laughs> I told you weddings are magical, right? So um, I'm grateful to have the opportunity to work with super talented team made up of uh, CG artists, and uh, they work, okay, well, I'll tell you more after, after this, but thank you. Yeah. All right, we'll jump into questions. I've seen the live demo, it's awesome. I, I was really taken aback by it. Um, Who wants to start us off in the back in the middle? Hi, um, do you have a, a target audience? I would guess it would be the venues, but it sounded like you were talking more like the brides, so I'm just curious about that and if you have a pricing model. Um, right now, we are targeting the uh, banquet uh, venue, the banquet facility, and uh, that's our main target, and uh, vendors. Hello, quick follow-up. Follow um, how do you make sure that you have like what they actually have? I mean, you were showing like 20 colors of seats, and I'm pretty sure most venues don't necessarily. Yeah, so, so that's a good question. Every day, we um, put in our virtual inventory, and we are adding more and more every day. So eventually, there's all kinds of things that you'll be able to find uh, in that database. Technically, when you add a venue, how do you how do you do that? Do you go into a tape measure and start measuring walls? I mean, how do you do? You already videotape it, and then it gets created into this. Or how it, it, it's like uh, it's like making a movie. Uh, uh, our digital artists are from the. Movie industry that works with Peter Jackson on the Lord of the Rings trilogy, um, you know King Kong, and you know so that's how this was possible. So we take pictures and measurement, and then we we would uh, model it. We model uh, pixel by pixel, and uh, and uh, you know and I'd be able to uh, texture it, you know, make it look just real, control the lighting, um, and uh, you know there's a lot of technical work that goes involved. So what's the development cycle on that leg? Like say I'm a say I'm a Eric's banquet hall and I give you money. How long does it take for me to end up in the system at full render? Uh, it um, if if we do this full time every day, uh, it will take about uh, two weeks. Uh, and as we do it, it, it gets faster because we, like I said, we keep a library of, uh, you know, uh, virtual inventory of like textures, uh, objects that we already have, you know, so as we do it, it gets faster. After a venue gets set up like that in two weeks, are they able to use your software to export movies for promotional purposes? That's the that's whole idea, um, is that the uh, brides will be able to see it, uh, you know, using the iPhone or uh, Android or um, iPad, and uh, they'll be able to access the room. So the banquet coordinator will be able to use the tool to uh, help the bride visualize it, a bride will be able to visualize it, and be able to communicate with the uh, banquet coordinator. I would presume that it would be the bride more often than the groom that would be visualizing it. So how come you don't have more women on your team? Maybe you can be the first. And you know what? Another funny thing is none of us are married. <laughs> scenes built, but then is there a licensing per, per wedding booked through it, or what, yeah, what's... It's, it's a great, great question. Uh, yes, yeah, that's a charge for a setup fee, and then after that we charge an annual subscription uh, fee. And uh, we do the same for the vendor as well. Yeah, so it's interesting ca capturing the internal, you know, three uh, internal map. You, there's, also, there's a company that started out of Ann Arbor, it's in Boulder now, called uh, Occipital, but they have a, a product called Structure. If you look up Structure.io, you can basically scan this entire room in minutes oh, wow. uh, with, a, with a camera, and it'll capture the full. But check, check out Structure.io. Yeah, I will. That's great. That will improve the time. Uh, you know, much quicker. That's very important. Yeah. yeah thanks for that, Doug. 
And you, uh, I just I'll, I'll play around this one we had talked before. Like uh, you came from the event planning industry, and so you saw actually this like gap being yeah. there. So that's yeah. like might not be married, but you saw this problem existing that right. especially venues that are far away, people couldn't see. So is that right. you finding that, that that's working well so yeah. far? For yeah. So we currently we are working with uh, the Marriott uh, hotel chain, and uh, uh, so that's very exciting for us. Uh, so we have a lot of rooms to do with them. Yeah, thank you. All right, we have our final tonight, and then hopefully you all have your community announcements ready to go. Um, I'd like to welcome Julie uh, Clear for a second education-related uh, product pitch tonight. Who's going to tell us about uh, Petit Zarafa? Yes. All right, pronounced it right this time. Salam and good evening. Uh, thank you so much for having me here. I'm a little nervous, um, but I'm really excited to introduce our education technology startup, which is called Petit Zarafa. And essentially what we're doing is empowering little ones to learn a second language through multi-sensory play. Um, we feel what we're really looking at is the big problem of um, we find that learning language uh, for little ones is best under the age of six, but we feel that schools really sort of fail in that area because they start very late and they don't have the best innovative methods in the way to do it, or they're lacking the educators in order to empower the little ones to learn those languages. Second to that, um, if parents are interested in teaching a second language to their child, they turn towards apps or towards DVDs, which increases uh, screen time for little ones. And I think we can all agree but I think there's just an overabundance of screen time for little ones, which isn't always necessarily the best effective way for learning. Um, so we feel that's, that's a big problem that we are looking to solve. Um, and our solution for that is uh, what we consider Duolingo meets Montessori, and we're really combining the best in early education practices with the best in technology. So we've got a, a ton of uh, hands-on activities for the children because we really feel they need to develop those motor skills, it's essential to them. And then pairing that with the second language, so we're incorporating that learning time, really enhancing that learning time. Um, and then we're using the technology as the reinforcement. It's not the only sole solution for the learning, but it's there as the reinforcement for the child through um, the listening and through the games, and then to help keep the caregiver uh, organized, as, and the caregiver and the child organized and motivated. And I'll show you a quick demo. should be a sensory experience for the little ones in terms of the touching, the tasting, the smelling, all the hands-on activities. And again, uh, pairing that with the technology part of it. Um, 
we're looking at a market size that we've been after. Um, for learning languages is on the rise, especially for little ones, in order to compete on the global marketplace. I think it's it's a skill that pretty much every parent is interested in their child in having. There's worldwide language learning, which you can see, and then child care is pretty big for little ones. Um, our revenue model is a subscription based, so we're looking at, we're still at the startup phase, um, but we're going, these are the numbers that we're going after for an average monthly fee of $10, which I think is, is fair. Um, where we're at in terms our, of our market adoption is that we, uh, we've tested it with uh, busy parents um, and we got really great reviews on it and we have a pre-pilot is underway. We're based in Tangier, Morocco, even though I'm from the Midwest. Um, and so we have a pilot underway in, in, at the American School in Tangier, which was the first school in Morocco, American School. And then we're enrolling two preschools a week in Morocco currently. So that's where we are for market adoption. Our competition, again, everything is relies heavily either on the on-screen learning um, or you've got bilingual nannies and language classes in preschools and we want to position ourselves as a balance between those two. Our competitive advantages, um, we feel that we really have an innovative approach where we're balancing both worlds nicely. Um, so just to continue, so. Well, thank you so much. So I would love, I, I think I said to Julia when I saw this that like, I, would, I want it, can I use it? <laughs> it's a great idea. Uh, let's ask some questions. Okay. Yes. Back. So your multi-sensory um, feature, I guess, or whatever you're calling it up there. I saw Play-Doh, I saw a lot of cutouts, scissors, paper. I mean, are, are those are those things that could potentially be an upsell that they could, they could purchase through your organization? For instance, I mean, I'm I'm lazy, right? Like, I don't want to go to the right. store and buy all these arts and crafts kinds of things, but I have money, so I would rather just buy it and then have it delivered to me. That's, that's a good question, and it's something that we've considered as well of pre-preparing those kits so they're just sort of ready to go. Again, it's an inventory question. We want to see how we really want to focus our time of just driving and building really good content, and then we'll see if there's the demand. Because that's such a busy. That's such a busy space as well for right. a lot of people, you know, the, the Kiwi kits and things like that. And it seems like that's the, the, the type of family that you're going after mm -hmm. are the busy parents. Exactly, yeah. It's something that we're considering. Okay. Yeah. So, yes, how do you, uh, because I guess when you are you 1 to 6 or 0 to 6, mm -hmm. how do you start? Um, do you have <coughs> levels based on the age, or is just a question of what, you know? Um, mm -hmm. That's that a good question. Yeah, we are sort of catering it for the two to three year olds and then sort of scaling that for the four to six. And we don't see it as a comprehensive curriculum of you'll walk away fluent in the language, but it's a baseline, it's a starting point for a year to give those kids that introduction so that way, then when they move on, they'll already have that baseline with them. But we, yeah, we take in the ages into consideration for sure because there's such a difference between the learning styles just within that year range alone. It's a big one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, how does this apply to adults that are trying to learn? Uh, I guess something that could apply to adults as well because I mean that's the way. Again, I'm based in Morocco. I've been there for 15 years. I'm a Midwesterner. I showed up in Morocco not knowing any of the language. My husband's Moroccan, and he was like, I'm your husband, but I'm not your translator, so good luck. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And I usually take classes, because I'm not really kind of a sit down, you know, I'm an educator, I'm an artist, so I really like that hands-on process. So it was just something that I think was a, it was a more active way for me to learn, of just like getting in there. And so I think it's something that is attractive to an adult learner as well. Use your experience yeah, yeah. Because I'm super passionate about kids, that's the okay. that's our focus for now. But yeah. Question back over here. Oh, quick questions. Actually, you had mentioned that it's double uh, edged swords that uh, the, the schools right start language late, right? Mm -hmm. and sometimes, I mean, just use you as an example. We don't necessarily have second language in the public school, as mm -hmm. in you and charters. 
I don't know how do you, do you see that as kind of a problem because the kids start with try trying more, right? But when they hit the school age, it stopped. Mm -hmm. So I mean, I mean, for me, if I'm a parent, I invest in let's say two, three years of the subscription, whatever, mm -hmm. but only to waste. So I don't know whether that's yeah, kind of to, to continue, you mean? Yeah, I mean, that, that could be a potential threat to your growth because people, when they realize. They want to stay. Exactly. Yeah, so I think what we, because we're still at the startup phase, we want to do the first year really well and then grow in the years mm -hmm. as we go. So you have a plan to grow in the ages. Yeah, years. because we've had that request too as well. Yeah. Yes. So if your market, and we'll use the busy parent scenario. And so my subscription is buying into your content, into your curriculum, into mm -hmm. your guidance. And I'm just trying to balance between if you're a busy parent already, mm -hmm. the investment and time to do this. I'm trying to balance this, sure. you know, that mm -hmm. it, I don't even know how to word the question other than there's, there, there is an investment I have to make in your content, following the curriculum and doing mm -hmm. these things. And so I'm just saying, is that kind of go against the busy parent. Which is, I think it's a great question, and it's also one, I think, when you're specifically looking at this age, age two to six, those kids are with someone anyway, and they need a lot of hands-on attention. So there's someone who's investing that time regardless, whether it's a caregiver, a nanny, or that parent. So we want to help that parent get really organized. We're keeping the activities really simple, so it's not this high-maintenance, really complicated thing, but it's really about those, those bonding moments and I was like, okay, well, I've got 15 minutes. What can I do with my kid? And I think any parent in here will raise their hand to say, okay, what can I do for 15 minutes where my child is not on that screen, where I can do something that's really meaningful and sort of build the bonds that way? Because I think it can happen in those small moments. It doesn't need to be this real high maintenance thing. Cool. Is there one more question? Is it web based only or apps or? It's web based for now. Mm -hmm. And it's respond the site that we have it's responsive. So hopefully we'll get to the app stage. Yes. Awesome. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Any announcements from looking for a job, hiring, uh, other meetups you want to plug? If you could form like a little line down here and make, we'll just make announcements right up here for the next couple minutes to wrap up. And really, anything, anything goes. It's, uh, it's a unique opportunity about the blast out here. And then if you want to also do it over here. You can also mention it on the comments in the meetup group, and that will get sent out to everybody. Um, so, start us off. Cool. Uh, hey, everybody. I know some of you, but not all of you. Um, I'm Nick Oliverio. I work at Olark. Um, back over the summer, I helped found a Ann Arbor CX meetup um, that's been going pretty well. Um, and in about September, we started talking about wouldn't it be cool to do a conference to bring a community like this together over a longer period of time than just you know during this meetup. Uh, so I've been working in secret, uh, or mostly in secret. We just decided in the last like week that this idea is far enough along and it's not going to be a colossal failure uh, that we can tell people about it. And I'm really excited. Uh, so myself, a team from uh, Duo, some folks from Nutshell, and Farmlogs have been working to put together this conference. Uh, we're calling it Mitten State of the Art. It's going to be May 13th and 14th of 2016. Uh, and we're super, ex like I said, super excited. Um, and there are, you know, are going to be details to follow, but if that sounds like something that is cool to you, or not cool and you think it's a terrible idea and we should change our minds, uh, <laughs> let me know. I'll be in the back there. Uh, yeah, thanks. Cool. What's the date again? May 13th and 14th. And it's about? Uh, it, well, that's a, that's a good question. I didn't really mention that. Um, so there's sort of these two communities in Ann Arbor. There's a tech community and there's an arts community, a more you know, traditional towny community. And we want to bring these two groups of people together because we think there's a lot of information that they can share. So the creative community. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, yeah, cool. Good question. Thanks. Okay. I'm the CEO of Atlas, and uh, I was awarded over $100,000 in scholarships and merit-based grants. And um, I noticed a lot of students needed help with personalized assistance. 
So I came up with um, a business platform to um, cater to people's objectives based on a user profile and a searcher, customized a Google search string. And there's currently over 60 components to the site. Um, and I'm looking for a web developer because my background is in women's studies and business entrepreneurship. So I'm not, uh, I'm not a techie. Um, and yeah, my email is idam at umich.edu. And yeah, that's my website. <laughs> You can post that on the meetup. Yeah, definitely post that. Thanks. Hey guys, my name is AJ. I'm a sophomore studying industrial engineering, and I'm working on a travel startup called Explore. We're looking to help simplify group travel planning by helping groups make quicker, more unified decisions. Uh, it's really exciting. We're working on this all semester, uh, and we're looking to do some uh, customer discovery. Now, I've been doing it all uh, so far. I'd really like to speak with any of you who travel in groups before and they kind of gone through the process of making decisions when you're taking into everyone's different individual accounts. I think that's something that's really interesting. That's kind of consensus decision making that goes on there with groups, where everyone's trying to figure out okay, what does he want, what does he want, and kind of make a decision based off of that. Uh, we're looking to help make the uh, process a little bit less indecisive. Uh, and so I'd really, really appreciate if any of you guys would be able to give me like 20 minutes of your time just to chat a bit and ask some questions about your experience, what that was like. Uh, thank you. Appreciate it. Hey everyone. I run a couple meetups here in Ann Arbor. One of them is the A2 Brew Tech, kind of one of the sister meetups for the A2 New Tech organization. And also uh, uh, Coffee House Coders here in Ann Arbor, which is a group kind of trying to help people learn to code and uh, also uh, get into entrepreneurship. Uh, we have a meetup tomorrow at uh, Espresso Real. It's on meetup as well. Uh, uh, look for uh, A2 Coffeehouse Coders, and uh, we hope to see you there. Thanks. Hi, hi, my name is Pat Webster. I don't know any of you, which is really strange for the day. Uh, but I keep a colleague of mine. Uh, I'm currently an unemployed software developer and season season um, sysadmin. So if anybody needs that kind of work uh, or has that kind of work for me, let me know. I'm Who's hiring? Me. Raise hands. Anybody? Who's, who's hiring? We've a few. <laughs> Raise your hand. Awesome. All right. Cool. Great. Okay, that works. All right. Uh, I'm Doug. I'm CEO of a company called Duo Security. Um, want to make sure you have a save the date uh, for February 9th. Uh, we're taking the Michigan Theater and uh, we're actually hosting a film called Code Documentary. So if you go look at codedocumentary.com, you'll see it's a film about uh, trying to debug the gender gap in the tech community. And so um, anyway, we, uh, we'll have the main theater, you know, 2,000 seats. Uh, so check it out. It'll be part of a longer, kind of week-long series of the Michigan Theater's hosting on actually science, uh, more generally, and tech. And uh, we'd love to see you all there. Okay, I think that's the, the wrap for the evening. Um, awesome presentation. Thank you, all our presenters. They were really, really great presentations tonight. Um, we, uh, we always wander over to Pizza House, uh, just a couple blocks away after this. Feel free to mingle, talk to some of the presenters here. And um, uh, anyone who you know, saw these pitches and thought they might know someone who might be good to pitch here, organizers at a2newtech.org. And uh, thank you so much for coming out.